all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters method of farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do uh, pass. A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they bring is that a bigger number or is two billion a bigger number i don't know Sam. it's a tough one i know it's really hard and maybe maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh jeremy strong gotta go kill a jenny i still don't think you should kill her i don't think it's a good idea it's a ghost dude welcome back everybody to bread theory tonight we're going to be continuing on with the prager you documentary on helping the homelessness or helping the homeless uh, their, their answers to ending uh, homelessness, which uh, we, we're only about seven and a half minutes into it, but already it's, it's you know, as, as you can imagine, pretty disappointing in the sort of stuff they come up with. It's, it's, it's sort of what you would expect. Homelessness is a personal issue. It's, 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 for, it's due to personal failings. They vaguely gesture at drug use as being the cause of homelessness. <laughs> Um, well, at the same time saying that a housing first program that also includes um, access to drug treatment is, is not a good way of doing things, even though it has shown pretty clear that it, uh, it has better results than any other method. Um, but they also gloss over the, the fact that there is in these programs um, access to, to counseling for mental health, for drug use and stuff like that they, they they take issue with it not being mandatory as a condition of the housing that's how they would like to have things a bunch of uh hoops that homeless people would have to jump through to prove that they are the deserving poor uh worthy of having societal resources given to them in order to um help them get back up on their feet so that's that's generally their solutions to it is uh yeah, set up a whole bunch of bureaucracy, um, make people prove that they have a job, that they're clean from drugs, stuff like that. They don't ever, whoops, I didn't mean to, to share that instead. Uh, they never show that this is a better way, even though they, <laughs> it's the one that they're touting. They have no, no data to back it up so far. I, I don't think they will through the entire documentary here. I, I haven't watched the whole thing, so I'm just speculating, but uh, based on what we've seen so far, <laughs> basically their, their, their strategy is to vaguely gesture, and this is Prager you in general, vaguely gesture at things so that you don't have to actually produce hard data about it. And when you do produce hard data to back up a point, um, make sure that it's, broad enough that it could be interpreted in different ways or a lie through omission like that. That's what they did with the statistic about um, the housing first program in San Francisco. They're like, well, all, the, all these units have been costing about $600,000 per unit uh, to, to give homeless people housing in San Francisco. Why does in the, why why such waste in money? Because the average home price in the United States is half of that, which of course omits the fact that the average home price within San Francisco is double that six hundred thousand number. Oh wow! Hello, I Dan Simpson. Thank you so much for the the raid. Appreciate it very much. Everyone, go check out I Dan Simpson. Really great content creator. Um. Let me just show you out here in a second. So welcome in Raiders. We are looking at a PragerU documentary on homelessness tonight. Um, and we're going to be <laughs> point by point, very meticulously debunking the claims that they make. So let's, let's hope that shout out works. Stream elements has not been working. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and the auto mod. <laughs> taking out uh, the middle of, of Idan Simpson's name. I don't know how to change that, so 
I apologize for it garbling your name there, Dan. But thank you so much for the raid. Um, welcome in, everybody. Uh, and before we get started, I did want to mention that I do have brand new merch out in my um, in my Stream Elements store. So I'm quickly going to put that link in the chat. Got hats and um, hoodies, stickers, all sorts of cool new stuff up with the Bread Theory logo. All right, so there's the link for that. Okay, let's move into the documentary itself again. So this is only a, a, a 23 minute documentary. And last time it took me about two hours to get through the first seven and a half minutes of it because there's just so much garbage. And it's kind of like what they say that uh, a lie has traveled a thousand miles before the truth has even had time to put on its shoes. And, and finding that statement to be very true or that, that adage to be very true in this case because I'm, I'm having to stop every few seconds to be like, no, that's a mischaracterization or no, that's, that's just an outright lie and having to go through and, and look up better data about what they're talking about. So PragerU, um, for those just joining me, is their, their basic position is that they think the best way to, to end the homelessness is to set up a bunch of hoops for homeless people to jump through in order to prove that they are the worthy poor, right? So they have to prove that they have a job, and they have to prove that they are clean from drugs before they are given housing. Um, they're touting these various, um, these various programs that have uh, those as requirements, and, and then just kind of denigrating the housing first alternative um, without ever really providing any data about which one actually has better results. Um, but yeah, that, that's their basic position. All right, let's get into the documentary now. So, so we're, uh, at the point in the video where the, the, the guy that they're interviewing, he's part of this, this, um, I don't, I don't even know what you would call it. Uh, but it is basically the, the prove you're worthy homeless alleviation program. So he's, he's just glossed over the fact that Housing First programs do in fact provide drug counseling and mental health counseling. They just don't force it on you. So he's, he's, he's really mad that they don't force it on the participants, even though it's been shown. And we looked at some stats from Catholic Charities, which is not exactly known to be the most progressive organization, but they do too have a, a Housing First program. And they themselves said that just giving, pro providing these services without forcing it has a better success rate. Because people don't like to be told what to do, basically, is, is the, the way that they look at it. All right, continuing on in the video. I'm still going to serve those that are in need or somebody that's going to always be less fortunate than me. We've worked with programs that, when they first started, like taking people off of the street housing programs, people would live in houses and live in rooms and still like they were living on the street. They wouldn't sleep in the bed. Everything was close to them. So, so here we go. Criticizing people that, that are in this Housing First program for not immediately integrating into uh, or reintegrating into a, a situation where they have, you know, a safe place to live. You talk about how they'd sleep on the floors instead of in the beds, as though that's somehow proof that the program doesn't work. Um, when if you've been living on the street for the past who knows how many years, it might just feel like the most safe place to, to not be on top of a bed. It, it's going to take some getting used to. Um, I, I, I'm thinking now of uh, that, that scene in Castaway where he finally comes back to civilization. And it's the same thing. He gets a, a nice hotel room, which they give him a bunch of shrimp and crab and other stuff that he is sick of eating for the past few years. But in, civiliz in uh, civilized areas, it's, it's considered, you know, you know, A plus food. Um, so he's not too interested in that. And then he's used to sleeping on the ground. So instead of in the, the nice, you know, king size hotel bed, he sleeps on the ground. And I, I, <laughs> I think that's a pretty accurate portrayal of people that have not lived in, in civilized is even kind of a loaded term, um, but just have not had a, a permanent shelter for some time. I think it's, 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 it's pretty understandable. They wouldn't want to jump right back into, you know, living as, as, as most people in civilization do. 
paranoia set in. They didn't trust anybody being in there. They didn't even know how to live inside. Are we providing housing for homeless people so they can get off the street so we don't have to look at them? Are we providing them housing so they can be able to sustain themselves and be able to live? <laughs> so, <laughs> once more, you know, when he says, are we, are we just taking them off the street so that we don't have to look at them? This has been their charge against the Housing First policy, that all they do is provide housing, and what do you know, a lot of them end up back on the street, as though that's all they're doing. But that's never all they're doing. They're also, as I've, I've been saying, giving them drug counseling options, giving them mental health counseling options, trying to help reintegrate integrate them little by little at their own pace back into society. Because being homeless is a very traumatizing experience. Uh, and the longer you're on the street, the more trauma you're going to endure. Um, you know, police treat you like garbage. Um, sometimes you get treated by garbage, like garbage by other homeless people or, or any number of random people that you might meet because you have no way of, of escaping <laughs> uh, people. You know, you were just out there exposed. So <laughs> it, it's a pretty common occurrence that a lot of trauma is going to happen. And you got on the top of that, um, the certain the, the things that people often do to survive. They might have survival sex, might uh, be become a sex worker in order to survive when maybe they otherwise wouldn't make that choice. Um, and just the the rampant drug use that that does take place among homeless people. They'll never get into the 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 cause of that from PragerU's side, but it's pretty clear that that it has caused by that trauma, so, but, but it ends up being trauma that compounds upon itself. So in order to escape the horribleness of your reality, you do drugs or you, you drink um, as a homeless person, which can end up becoming a, a vicious cycle where then, uh, you know, a lot of the money that you do make, um, panhandling or collecting cans or whatever, goes back into that. And it's not as though the trauma stops because you, you're doing drugs, it just continues on. So there's even further cause to keep trying to kill that pain. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of trauma that happens just by being a homeless person. Um, so anyway, back to, to what this guy's charge was, was that these Housing First programs, all they do is give them housing and that's it. Well, that's that's not true. We've, we've looked into that. I can put up the, the stat again just for those who haven't maybe seen it yet. So let's look at the Catholic Charities one for some context here. So this is their Housing, housing First program. And uh, it says it helps long-term homeless men and women secure housing and connect them to supportive services to help uh, them remain housed. So not just giving them a place to live. Housing First does not mean housing only. They also give other stuff too. The Rapid Rehousing Program helps people experiencing short-term homelessness of less than a year find housing and provide limited follow-up services for six months. So that would be people that get kicked out of their apartment for whatever reason, or, or perhaps have to flee whatever living situation they're in. So it's people that, that have a good chance of, of bouncing back if they get that temporary support. That's, that's the, the um, Rapid Rehousing Program. So Housing First is a national model that delivers services in more dignified and compassionate, in a, a more dignified and compassionate way by providing people who are homeless with the stability of housing and then, critically, then, not only, but then offering supportive services to address the, the barriers to stabilization, working through strategic partnerships with a consortium of local service providers in Hennepin and Ramsey County. This, this is for Minneapolis Catholic Charities. Um, Catholic Charities provides the initial outreach and the, the service that, uh, the services that follow once people are placed. Follow-up services include helping secure social security or veterans benefits. Still a lot of, vet, of, of homeless veterans on the, on the streets. That is a big cause of homelessness. And that again, ties in with that trauma and, and the, the difficulty of reintegrating into society that can lead a lot of veterans um, if they don't have a strong support network to end up on the street again, or not, or, or for the first time, in fact. Um, transportation to medical appointments. So 
if you have medication that you need that that if you didn't would increase your likelihood of, of homelessness if you know uh, drugs for like mental health and stuff like that that could be a key thing that you need um, that you might not be able to get if you're homeless and not able to travel very much so they're providing that 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 transportation to help you succeed um, unfortunately that you know we don't have universal health care in the United States but if we had that as well, that would be an even bigger boon to people getting up off the street. Uh, basic necessities such as food and furniture and referrals to community resources. So they're, they're trying to give them the dignity of housing and all of that and all that that encompasses, not just, you know, four walls and a door, um, but everything. All the sorts of things that go into making a house like a, a home, a a, a base of support that you can then push up off of yourself. Okay, so the services that they include are things such as scattered site housing in the Twin Cities for single men and women and families, follow-up support services to help people maintain their housing, tenant and landlord mediation. Again, if you, if you experience a lot of trauma being on, on the streets, you might have trouble dealing with people in authority positions, such as your landlord. Um, and if you're struggling to get back up on your feet, you might again fall behind on rent and, and, and that sort of thing. Or there may just be miscommunications between you and uh, your landlord. So they, they help with that too. And then referrals to community resources. So that'd be for all the other stuff, uh, mental health treatment, drug treatment, all that, that sort of thing. So <laughs> a lot more than they are letting on in, in this PragerU documentary. All right, let's get back to the video or the documentary itself. A thousand individuals dying on the streets every year is not compassionate. And merely saying we're going to let people camp on the streets because we think it's uncompassionate to push them off it is not the right path. Places. <laughs> I hate I hate to have to do this, but there every single sentence in this documentary so far has had some sort of lie or misrepresentation in it. So. For one thing, if you have a housing first policy and, you, and you're trying to get people off the street, that's that's trying to get them off the street. That's not just letting them be there. Allowing people to camp is is not any kind of a solution. It's just trying not to make things worse. It's not breaking up people's uh, uh, encampments that they do. Uh, and, they, and they never ask that reason either. Why do people make homeless encampments? Usually it's going to be for things like... Um, basic basic mutual aid between homeless people so they can look out for one another maintain some semblance of security amongst one another uh, against people that would hurt them which could be anybody and and certainly often is people like the police um, it's it's just a way to it's just a basic way of getting together and helping out one another in really bad situations that no one wants to stay in they're acting as though if we allow homeless encampments that they'll only grow and they'll they'll only it, like like it's some sort of a an easy life that these people are just needing motivation to get out of as, as though being homeless and, and having a homeless camp is what people do when they just you know don't feel like working <laughs> or don't feel like trying to to better their situation or secure the necessities of life for themselves and that they they really need that extra prodding well the extra prodding is being homeless i don't i i mean i mean for one thing they haven't interviewed a single homeless person in this entire documentary and i don't think they probably will because they don't really care about their perspectives but if they did i would i would wager to say that uh they would find a lot of stories of people that don't want to be there I don't. I, I doubt there would be a single person that they could interview that would enjoy living in a homeless encampment, or, or a tent city, or a shanty town, or whatever you want to call it, or just out on the street. No, no one likes living that way. People end up living that way for a variety of reasons. Um, but basically, it comes down to you slip and fall, you know, metaphorically speaking, and you don't have enough of a support network to catch you. Um, I mean, there's been times when my, my wife and I, we uh, 
have come up short on bills. And if it were not for help from friends and family, we would have been out on the street. But we did have that support network. There's a lot of people that don't. Uh, and they end up, you know, coming up short one month and they have an uncaring landlord and they just end up on the street and then things precipitate from there. Uh, but yeah, they, Pergury is not interested in, in those sorts of stories or back or backstories. Um, they don't care why people become homeless. They, they, they basically determined that it, uh, in their minds, that it is because of moral failings, you know, however way you slice it, it's, it's you know, having um, weak morals and, and, you know, getting into drugs that leads to homelessness or just being a violent um, or otherwise criminal person that ends up causing people to be homeless. Um, so they're not really interested in digging much deeper than that. But anyway, it's compassionate to push them, to not push them off the street. As though if you break up a homeless encampment, those people just like, <laughs> what, what, where do they think they go? D down to the employment office to, to get a job so they can get a, a place to rent uh, when they probably don't even have much of a credit score at that point, uh, if, if at all. Um, in which case, there's almost no you know, property companies that will rent to you. There's no landlords that will rent to you in that case. Um, even, you know, I've, I've tried to rent from just like mom and pop, uh, people that, that own like an, a second property that they rent out. They ask for credit scores and, and criminal records and all that sort of thing as well. So just breaking up their camp and stealing their stuff is not really going to be the motivation that they think it is. Uh, and again, they, they, they have no data to, to say otherwise. They're just going to assume that they're right. That if you just push people, they will stop being homeless. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bizarre, and it's really itself the uncompassionate position. Continuing on, though. Like San Diego and others say, listen, if we're going to push you off the streets, we're going to give you an alternative. And according to we're going to give you an alternative like a housing first program. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that that's good to give these, these people alternatives to where they're at. There's, there's again, no one thinks that, that it is an actual fix to just make it legal for people to camp wherever they, they feel like that's just a stopgap. It's, it's, it's a realization that the problem is, is larger than, the, the given municipality is able or more likely willing to deal with in a, in a meaningful and, and permanent way that, that, uh, that is not just pushing them out of the city somewhere else, but actually trying to get them up off the street and into housing and, and re-stabilized. Um, that's, that's what allowing camping on the street is. But yeah, that, that's great to give them alternatives, but we should go by what works best and what works best is a housing first solution coupled with access to various um, mental health and, and drug rehabil rehabilitation services and just reintegrating them into community living, you know, giving them a, a support network like you would give any person who is, is trying to recover from whatever trauma in their life. So to people who have experienced homelessness firsthand, the root of the problem is mental illness and addiction, not housing. Good morning. The meeting will come to order. Welcome to the Thursday, February 11th meeting of the Public Safety and Neighborhood Services Committee. Agenda one is a hearing on the San Francisco Recovery Summit Working Group Report and Findings. Tom Wolf, I'd like to invite you to speak. Good morning, everyone. Uh, only three years ago today, I was sleeping on a piece of cardboard in the doorway on Golden Gate and Hyde in the Tenderloin, severely addicted to heroin. I am living proof that there is a direct correlation between homelessness and substance use in the city. Yeah, it's because substance use is primarily a, a, a way to kill pain. You know, you could, you could boil down the, the, the reasons and rationales for doing drugs on a, on a, on a like, habitual basis, not just recreationally, but like in a hardcore way. 
um, to pain killing. It's, it's your life is not going as you want it to. Um, you've probably experienced traumas of one kind or another, and this is all you have for, for coping with that. that. That's what causes substance abuse. And that, that can lead to homelessness if, if you, um, if, if all of your money goes towards doing more drugs and you let the bills slip and, and then you find yourself evicted and out on the street, that, that could end up that way. Um, or it could be the other way around where due to whatever circumstances you find yourself homeless and then you get in with drug use again, because it's, it's killing the pain of your, <laughs> your pretty horrible current reality. Um, so yes, there is a, there is a correlation, but since they've found that the best way to help people with those issues is to just offer them the services rather than force them to take those services in order to get on, uh, you know, into home, into housing, then that's probably the strategy we should take. <laughs> you can build all the housing and get everybody off the street housed, but if you're struggling with addiction or mental illness, you're just housed with drug addiction and mental illness. So we should have some universal health care then, huh? Wouldn't that be the, the next logical component of that, that solution? Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be it? If, if people need mental health counseling, which, hey, guess what? Your brain, your emotions, that's, that's also part of health. Um, it's, it doesn't, you know, health care doesn't just stop at your physical body. Um, and it certainly doesn't exclude dental and, and, and you know, hearing and, and vision and all that other stuff, but that's even beside the point. It also doesn't stop inside of your, your head. It doesn't stop with your emotions and your, your thoughts. So if people need these services to help them stabilize, then, then yeah, we should, we should be working on getting everyone that stuff so that that never is an issue, that never is a barrier. Otherwise, you're just saying that we, we care more about, I don't know, uh, proving a point that, that you deserve what you get or whatever, more so than we believe in helping, actually helping people get out of it. Because if, if all you care about is helping people uh, become stabilized and, and stop being homeless, then that, yeah, that shouldn't matter if you think they deserve health care or not. Your goal is to stabilize them. So that should include health care, whether you think they deserve it or not. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, let's hear this, this guy's more of this guy's story. People say, oh, I lost my job and I became homeless. But then you have to ask, why did you lose your job? I lost my job because I was going to work and shooting up in the bathroom on my lunch break and then going back and sitting on my desk and passing out. So this one guy apparently is representative of, of all homeless people's stories uh, because that's the way it went for him. It has to be the way it goes for everybody. It's this strange thing about conservatism. Is they, 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 they talk and talk about how you know every person has individual circumstances it's all to do individual things but then they like to generalize when it comes to people that they don't like so this guy's individual story is that he became addicted to heroin and it cost him his job and he ended up on the street also doing heroin um therefore in their minds that that has to be the the, the story for all the homeless people and, and it's strange because what what happened to the individual and all that? This is one individual story. But you're always talking about how one individual story shouldn't represent the whole. Um, except, for, <laughs> except for when it's people that they don't like, which is obviously homeless people. From what I saw and the people that I encountered on the street, it's about eight out of every ten people that, that are visible, that we see every day out on the street, living in tents, etc. They're struggling with addiction. A recent study agreed. Okay, so that's that's even still 20% of people, that, that's one out of five homeless people, uh, that don't have an addiction. So why are they homeless? They said that, that I, I guess their other cause was mental illness, so they must believe that it that, that you know, 20% mental illness is their, is their cause. Um, but but even but it doesn't really even matter. It doesn't the cause doesn't really matter as much as 
figuring out what works, helping people get back on their feet and then doing it. Right. Otherwise we're just, you know, standing on a, in a moral position or moral grandstanding. Um, because either, either they deserve to get up off their feet or, or they don't. And if you think that they do, then even if you disagree with the, the choices that they made to get there, you should still want them to be able to be stabilized by any means available. So, yeah. But, but again, the, the solution that he's winding up to here is, is we have to have addiction counseling be part of, of getting people into housing otherwise they'll just end up homeless again and 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 that is true addiction counseling should be a part of that it just shouldn't be forced and i know and i'm just gonna keep repeating myself but they keep repeating their same argument again so i i find that i have to but uh housing first policies also include counseling for addiction counseling for mental health counseling for different health problems that that could be barriers to reintegration um there's no reason you have to force any of that though it's been shown that you get better results when you don't force it you just offer it over 75 percent of unsheltered have a drug or alcohol addiction and a similar number also have a severe mental health disorder and, and that's a good point too uh kate's tv where they uh, quets tv is it like Give me, give me some help with your name, if you, if you, if you could, some pronunciation assistance. Uh, you say where they can be supervised. Yeah, right. So, so if they're just out on the, if they're just out on the street until they can prove that they're sober, that's going to be an uphill battle in the first place. Because, you know, you're not going to have them. Oh, Kitsukwadu. Okay. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that one right. I, I, I don't know for sure. But uh, anyway. Yeah, if they're just out on the street still doing drugs, how are you going to monitor whether or not they're staying sober there? I, I guess you could just daily drug test them, but that seems like an awful lot of bureaucracy and invasion of privacy and, and so on and so forth. Um, but if they're in a community with, with other people that are, you know, trying to be supportive of them, uh, then those people can help out one another and, and they can be the, the eyes and ears that, more gently and less invasively uh, helps to to monitor progress if that's something that that needs to happen. Um, a facility has the flexibility of day stays. Yeah, that too. Sure. Uh, let's see. And I, I missed one of your comments back there. Mental illness. The solution isn't a house or apartment. We need to. Uh, we need live-in treatment facilities. I mean, that, that could be true in some cases. I don't know that that's true in every case. I think we got to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. So if, if just getting someone into housing and then offering them these services works, then, you know, that, that sounds good to me. Um, that, that should be the way that we go. If they need more intensive treatment, they should be offered that. But I think, again, trying to force people into these, these even into day treatment facilities, uh, that, that, that's going to end up having a low, uh, a low rate of success. There's going to be a lot of recidivism, you know, maybe, maybe they just will, a lot of people decide that they don't want to put up with the, um, authoritative nature of some of these facilities and they just give up and leave, decide it's going to be better to take their chances back out on the street. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, I, I don't remember exactly where. I had read it, but when we were looking over uh, direct care or, or housing first programs, it, it, it showed pretty clearly that the, the most successful way to do it is to um, is to offer services, have them them provided, have them offered, and then let them choose that that more often than trying to force them, they will get that treatment. And because they are making the choice to, because you're actually giving them the choice to, the real choice, they will own that decision a lot better and they will stick with it more often. And it's not talking about saving everyone per se, because we, we shouldn't take a, a charity mentality where you have 
the, the, the thing about charity is it, it takes the position that we're going to give help to people that don't deserve it, basically. These, these people through moral failings or, or just being making bad choices that we didn't make have, have ended up in bad positions. And now we are going to come in through our benevolence and give them the help that they don't necessarily deserve, but because we're good and better people, we're going to give it to them anyway. I think that's a terrible way of looking at helping other people. It creates a paternalistic sort of relationship that, I mean, it robs them of the, the dignity of being an adult with, you know, agency and ability to make decisions for themselves. And it, it doesn't treat them as though they can be successful, you know, with or without your help. You know, it, it treats them as though, you know, they're just going to continue on having terrible lives unless I intervene, you know, with my money or my support or whatever. So it's not a matter of saving everybody, I wouldn't say. It's, it's more a matter of providing the necessities of, of life to everyone, including people on the streets. Now, now I personally, as a leftist, I, I think it's important that everyone is provided with all the necessities of life, no matter what decisions they've made in life, whether or not I agree with those decisions, whether or not I think that those decisions are going to hurt them in the long term. I think they still deserve the basics of life. You know, it's, 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 that, it's that old idea in the, the Declaration of Independence that, that everyone deserves life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How can you have a guarantee to life if you don't have guarantee to life-saving medicine or shelter with, with, without which you might die of exposure or exposure to violence? Um, how can you be guaranteed life if you don't have food? Um, if there's decisions you can make that could, could deny you food, basic, the basic sustenance of life. Um, how can you have liberty if you are struggling every day without one of those basic necessities or without several of those basic necessities? You don't really have much choice at that point. You basically just have to do whatever is in front of you and is the least bad option or at least in your mind, the least bad option. How can you pursue happiness if you don't have a stable platform from which to do so? If, if you're, again, spending all of your time and energy scrambling just to survive, then you don't really ever have the ability to make choices and you don't have the ability to decide how you want to live in the world and, and how you want to contribute to the world. So I think these things are due everybody including homeless people, including people that, that perhaps made bad decisions. You know, I, I'm not going to say that every homeless person is homeless just due to forces beyond their control. Uh, that, that probably is not the case. But having said that, I still don't think that means they deserve death or to be denied life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. I think just being human beings, we are all basically of equal worth. Uh, so therefore we are do at, at least that uh, the basics of life so that that's the position i'm coming from thanks for following portside chats there's a bunch of other follows that i missed back there let me back up one one second so thanks for the follow to tech guy 420 sargon of god 2022 oh. i hope that is an ironic name um and then of course cats ttv Thanks so much for the follows. Let's get back to the video. I was a child support officer for the city and county of San Francisco. It was a very stressful job working with a lot of domestic violence victims. I became homeless because of my addiction, and I think a lot more people do become homeless because of addiction than what people think. That could be so. That could be so. It could be that 100% of people become homeless due to uh, addiction, which they're implying that it's a personal choice and a personal failing. That's always that's not always the case either. Uh, some people just turn to it because they're too poor to afford mental health counseling, and that's the only way to kill the pain. Um, or they just they think that's the best solution at the time, and before they know it, they get too far into using that as a coping strategy. Um, there's plenty of reasons to, that people get into drug addiction or get addicted to drugs or alcohol. That is not just because 
they personally made some bad decisions. But even if it is, even in the cases where it is, where they, you know, they, they had a perfectly happy, loving and supportive uh, uh, set of family and friends, they had a good job to sustain them, and then all of a sudden they thought it'd be really cool to try out heroin or meth or something like that. And eventually they got too far into it and ended up on the street. I still don't think they should die. <laughs> I don't think that that any decision they make, even if it's a bad one, should result in them dying or or being deprived of of agency in their life. Um, so yeah, so even if this guy even if what he's saying is true, which I don't think it is, I think he's he's uh, taking a very moralistic view of things that that it's all due to just personal choice and just personal um, moral failings and that. If they had not just made that choice, then their life would be completely different. And there's no outside circumstances at all. So I, I think that's a very simplistic, uh, childish way of, of, of viewing humanity and the world and the decisions that people make. There's, there's always a lot of factors that go into any decision people make. Even if it seems like a personal de decision, 100%. Um, let's say like you, just, you have enough money to buy a house. Um, it could be 100% your decision which house you buy that's within your budget. So again, some decisions are, are outside of your ability to make. You can't make a decision to, to buy a house that you cannot get financing for. Um, so even in that circumstance, there, there, are, there are factors outside of your control that, that do play a role in what decision you ultimately make. You're never making a clean 100% your own decision because we live in a society, you know, uh, all the different policies and, and, and interactions with other people, they affect us whether we like it or not. So, you know, no person is an island. Every decision that you make throughout your day, throughout your life has in some part factors in it that are outside of your control. And that doesn't matter who you are. That's always the case. So the three hours on my hat are for the Iron Front from World War II era. Uh, it's, it's basically anti-fascism. So the, the original Iron Front, the, the three hours stood for anti-fascist, anti-monarchist, and then anti-communist. But in, in later iterations of that, I, and, the, and the way that I take it personally, you switch out communism for capitalism. So anti-fascist, anti-monarchist, Anti-capitalist, basically anti-right ideologies. So that, to me, that's what the three arrows stand for. You know, scientifically, we know that addiction is a disease. So my survival instincts got basically corrupted by these drugs. I also needed drugs in the same kind of way that I needed food. I would do anything to get them. That, that's, that's, that's not, I don't think that's current science. Uh, the, the view that, that addiction is entirely just you know the chemical hooks of the drugs getting into you and then you relying on it the way you rely on food um i think the the, the emerging uh view of things is much closer to what i was talking about earlier the idea that that addiction is pain relief it, it is to kill pain from some port some part of a person's life to to not have to deal with some trauma or some horrible reality that that someone finds inescapable um so not quite the same as the way he's describing it but again it doesn't matter ultimately when we're talking about solutions the solution just should just be to support people with the basic necessities of life including health care including housing including food and transportation making up lies to get money from my family while i was out there and while I was on the street, homeless even then, I still thought I had some control over my life because all I really wanted in my addiction was the drugs. That's how powerful it is. Some people criticize me for some of the stuff that I say, but you know what? It can't just be all touchy-feely out there because being on the street is not touchy-feely. Who, who's, who's talking about it being touchy-feely? Having compassion for people? That, that's what it can't be? Because there's no compassion on the street? It, it, we can't have compassion for... Uh, people that have have slipped to the the lowest rungs of, of humanity for a given society 
that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I think I think solutions should lead with compassion. It should lead with with you know the assumption that um, basically everyone wants the same sorts of things for their life. Uh, that and, and again is, is life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. They want they want to continue being alive, and so they don't want to have to make tough decisions, one of which might end up killing them. So we should provide all the stuff that that prevents that from happening. Liberty. Uh, everyone wants to be able to feel like they are in the driver's seat of their own life. Um, so so again, that that can drive the way that we we treat these problems, the pursuit of happiness. Again wanting people to be able to uh, contribute to life in the way that they feel is best. Um, so touchy-feely, at the same time moralizing against people, saying that, that basically, it, it, you know, drug addiction is due to personal failings and, and, you know, you need to be punished for that. And if you can't prove that, that you have reformed yourself and uh, shown that you can live a life without these 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 um, crutches of, of drug addiction, then we're not going to help you. If you want to talk about putting emotion in it, into it, what else is there but that in that, in that sort of a, a framing? It's all emotion. It's pure emotion. It's, it's you don't deserve this, so you better prove that, that you can change or you're not going to get it. That, that's completely 100% a uh, uh, feelings sort of stance. That, that's not just, let's look at the numbers and see what's going to help you the most. That's follow my prescription, prove to me that, that, that you are worthy. Otherwise, you're not going to be and you're going to die. That, that 100% feels over any sort of reels. Cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles fail to realize the power of addiction and dangerously believe that addiction is a choice, not a disease. Well, well what? No. No, no, that is that. Uh, I mean, perhaps there are some that believe it is just a, a choice, but it seems more than anything that it is the right who believes that addiction is a choice, right? They believe that you make bad decisions that, that cause you to be addicted to, to drugs and then you get these chemical hooks and then you can't stop. So you make it, but you still have to make that initial choice, right? You still have to, to choose to do drugs that you end up being addicted to, right? <laughs> so, if anything, it's the right who believes that addiction is a choice, not something that can be treated um, as though you would treat any sort of emotional trauma or mental illness. So, so in a way, it is like a disease in the way that mental illness and, and emotional problems can be an illness um, if they get to the point where they are, are affecting your ability to live the sort of life you want to live. So in that way, sure, yeah, it can be like a disease. Because you can also treat that, too. Um, it's just you don't necessarily treat it in the same way you treat other physical diseases. It, it might involve medication, but it might not. It might just be talk therapy or just having building up a support network of, of people that, that love and care about the outcome of your life. Um, but no, no, no one is saying just that it's a disease, like, or that it's a choice, like you can just, you know, flip it on and off. I can just choose to, to not need heroin if I'm addicted to heroin. Like, obviously, those people are, are it, it is a choice in that they're choosing to cope with their life in that way, because they don't probably think they have a better option, or they have you know, they don't think too highly of themselves and they, they want to slowly kill themselves. Um, so in a certain way, it is kind of a choice, but it's only, it's only a choice if you think that every single thing you do is a choice. If you don't have all the options available to you, then it's, it's not really a choice. You're just making one of maybe two or three equally bad or worse possible choices that are available to you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a strange framing. I don't understand where he's going with that at all. They condone this behavior and even help promote it. <sighs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to link this video 
in the chat in case you want to come back and watch it yourself. Uh, I apologize. I have to stop it so often, but I do. Here, here is the current vid right now. If you ever want to look at it yourself, but I, I just keep having to stop. Like, like every sentence, a mischaracterization, an outright lie, um, or just, you know, made up whole cloth from who knows what, who knows where they're getting these ideas from. But if you want a housing first program, then that's not condoning homelessness. If you want to stop people from having their stuff stolen and their, their meager housing in, in tent cities destroyed and, and be run out of the city, that's not condoning homelessness. That's just saying it's better to leave these people alone than to, you know, crack down on them uh, to to destroy the homes and, and and push out the most vulnerable people in society not the same thing as condoning homelessness it's saying don't do that part uh, no one sees tent cities again i'll just reiterate no one sees tent cities as the final solution to homelessness absolutely nobody sees it that way no one is like oh that's okay that that should be their choice to to live that way because they recognize everyone recognizes no one wants to be homeless or very 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 few people actually want to be homeless if there was another option for them so vastly by and large no one wants to be homeless so that's not promoting it they, they, they cannot understand wanting to have you know the lesser of two evils ever so obviously they don't want people to, to continue to be homeless, but if there's not resources allocated by the city or by organizations locally to fix the problem, then the next best thing, the lesser of the two evils between allowing people to just live where they're at and leaving them alone or taking their stuff, locking them up or kicking them out of the city. Yeah, they, they're going to pick that, that first option, recognizing that it's not a good option. It's the same thing with, with uh, safe injection sites. You know, that, that is not condoning drug use. It is saying, if you're going to do it and there's not resources that we can throw at it to guide you out of that decision making, um, then you might as well at least do it in a place where you can be safer, that, that you'll have a less likelihood of, of uh, overdosing and dying and where you can have people to outreach to you should you decide to get out of your your addictive behaviors um but they they just cannot just they cannot understand that it has to for them laws are moral positions and that's it they they are just what the law is is what we condone what the law is not is what we are condoning against we're we're, we're, we're shunning people that that choose to do things that are not within the law uh, but that doesn't actually change anything, uh, believe it or not. Uh, all that does is end up with more people in jail, more people dying on the streets, um, because that, that does nothing to alleviate the underlying causes of homelessness. Anyway, continuing on. One of the main policies that I, I feel like I'm constantly back is the city's obsession harm reduction the baseline goal of harm. <laughs> what <laughs> what oh what is your obsession with reducing harm uh, it has to be all or nothing or why is it even a policy we can't just get people to make uh, to, to have better options it has to be the best option or no options uh, absolutely ridiculous stance Harm reduction is a good thing. <laughs> Why would you not want people to make less harmful choices and eventually make choices that, or be able to make choices that, that don't harm themselves, that actually are good for them? That, that's part of what harm reduction is. is event, it's it's, it's con a conveyor belt of, of choices, hopefully moving you along to ones that are actually good for you. <laughs> that's so bizarre. Hello, Portside Chats. How are you doing tonight? Um... Yeah, yeah, wow. What is, what is your obsession with harm reduction? So ridiculous. Harm reduction is to keep you alive long enough in the hopes that you'll find recovery. 
not in the hopes that you'll find recovery and also offer you recovery options that you as a as a, an adult with with choices again we want people to have choices right um are then free to explore if you are at a place where you can do that trying to push people to be ready for for recovery is not effective so yeah giving people options for it is good having places that 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 people who are doing harmful activities to themselves can go where they can also access resources if they are at a place where they want to stop or they're able to stop and want to stop yeah, that that's that's the best course of action because um, the alternative is to just sweep it under the rug <laughs> right uh, wow the idea is not just to to help you live long enough hoping that you will on your own just go seek out treatment it is to give those options to you as much and and as uh, persuasively as possible recognizing that trying to force people to to do these things is not, it's not a good way of it actually working um sunday scares yeah i feel that too yeah i i work as a landscaper that's my my main gig so we are in the the thick of spring planting and, and that sort of thing so it's, it's a very busy time for me to um so I, I feel that a lot. But yeah, hopefully hopefully sitting back and laughing at the ridiculousness of PragerU helps you uh, alleviate those Sunday scaries just a little bit. But what it's morphed into in San Francisco is something different. It's really blurring the lines between harm reduction and then drug promotion at the same time. How? How? <laughs> Where's the drug promotion? This is playing out on our streets is that instead of encouraging treatment what we say just keep on going every program that has a program has to have a harm reduction policy within it one of those requirements that's listed really down at the bottom and buried in there is that you need to have clean drug paraphernalia available at all times recognizing that that not providing that does not stop a single drug user from shooting up or or smoking or whatever vehicle of, of getting it into their body they they choose having having them share needles or share paraphernalia is 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 not a deterrence right especially if you have the view that that drugs are just like chemical hooks that that get in your brain and then you have to have it like food if you have to have it as much as food then you're gonna then then let's think of it like food if you were starving and the only food available to you or the only water available to you was possibly dirty. Would you take that risk or would you just starve? So if, if you really believe that, that, that drug use is like that, you know, having is a disease, like, like needing to have food, having drugs is like having to have food, then you're not going to, then, then taking away the option to have clean, ways of, of, of using drugs is not going to be a deterrent whatsoever. It makes absolutely no sense. So yeah, having drug, clean drug paraphernalia is good because spread, <laughs> allowing disease to continue to spread is worse. It is not saying here's also the drugs for it, unless you're, you know, helping wean people down from very dangerous drugs that, that are just, you know, if you just quit cold turkey, it could kill you. Um, but not even talking about those scenarios, just, just having clean needles and clean whatever paraphernalia is just a recognition, a recognition, a recognition that, uh, it's, it's better than having dirty paraphernalia. That's absolutely ridiculous that this is somehow drug promotion. I wasn't going to do heroin but, uh, because uh, I couldn't find any clean needles. But then this this program came by and, well, they provided me clean needles. So now I'm shooting up every day. It's, it's like they want me to. What a bizarre way to look at the world. Yeah. For the residents of your drug rehab, they'll hand out a pamphlet saying, here's some safe needs. ways <laughs> for you to use fentanyl so you don't overdose. Do you want them to overdose? <laughs> 
again, this is not this is not promotion of drugs. It's promotion of safe usage so that they don't die. And so that they don't end up, I mean, if, you, if you're thinking of things as a, as a, in a budgetary sense, which is really cold and cruel way of, of looking at it when we're talking about human lives, but, but if you are, then having people overdose more often is going to be a huge drain on the medical system and is going to make medical expenses go up for everybody else. So just from a fiscal policy, it is good for people to not overdose. So telling them, it's again... It's not as though they're not going to do fentanyl if they don't know how to do it without overdosing. That's not how that works. I, I was thinking of trying this fentanyl thing, but then, you know, I, I have no way of knowing how to do it safely, so I'm just not going to do it. As though that information wouldn't also just be available online. <laughs> but, but besides that point, clearly the policy is to prevent death. And it's kind of hard to house someone if they've overdosed and died or if they've, they've damaged their brain or their body so much that uh, they are more likely to die in the streets or even with housing. Like, this is an obvious, there's an obvious reason for these policies that they are somehow, I mean, they're, they're probably willfully not getting it, but uh, yeah, just, let's just move on. Make sure you use a clean needle. Make sure you clean the area that you're going to inject. Make sure you register it before you inject the needle inside your, your uh, vein. And then at the end of all that, it'll say, enjoy your high. Well, okay, we're not actually looking at, at this literature. Um, I would guess, though, <laughs> again, if, I mean, if, if that's the big gotcha, that enjoy your high, um... Which I doubt it. I, I'm sure that's a, a twisting and a paraphrasing of whatever they said. But we don't have the, the, the resources here. And of course, Pergy links none of their sources. Uh, very, very quick to link their merchandise, but, but not their sources. So, yep, they have a link to another documentary. There are... No, to the Cicero Institute, which they made this documentary with, and they have a link to a survey. No links to any. No links to any uh, source material for any of this. So we're just taking this guy's word. But of course, if you're someone who actually likes Prager U, you're not going to be too critical anyway. You're, you're just coming here for the the red meat. You know, let's let's stick it to the libs and. Uh, Make, make poor people and, and most vulnerable people feel even worse about themselves. And that, that's your goal. So, And feel better about yourselves by, by contrast, I guess. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not going to link to any primary source. But even if there was, let, let's say there was some smoking gun somewhere where, where some resource said, enjoy your high. Again, is that really going to be the tipping point? Hmm, I had all my paraphernalia set up. I made sure it was clean. I cleaned. I did all the things that the thing said. But it didn't tell me to enjoy the high, so I don't know if I even can. Like, is that the, the scenario that they're imagining playing out if that the, the, that wording was not there? Um, so you could try and, and figure out why they would say something like that, even if it is a paraphrased way of, of, what they, <laughs> of stating what they actually said. Probably they're trying to ingratiate themselves with the people that they're trying to serve, you know? So instead of just talking down to them or saying, you don't deserve these resources, but we're going to give them to you anyway because we're good people, they're trying to, you know, show that they care about the person. But still, what a, what a, what a, what a stupid thing to say. No one, no one is getting high because people wish them a good high. No one is not getting high because nobody wished them a good high. Here I am trying to kick heroin, man, and I'm in the drug rehab, and I walk by the table every day with syringes and cookers and foil and, and straws looking right at me, and pipes, and you wonder why nobody's getting clean. You... All right, now we're going to have to look up more stats again. Nobody's getting clean. Nobody's getting clean. <laughs> uh Let's let's look at drug rehab. Oh, let's, 
let's just look at all of drug rehab programs. All right, let's see if we can find one specifically about homelessness. Uh, homeless drug rehab recidivism rate. Let's see what we can find. Uh, recidivism. I just didn't learn to spell. Uh. Let's see. Oh, let's look at this. Here we go. Here's a, here's a Yale study. I will share this tab as soon as it loads. Oh, computer's being very slow today. As soon as it loads. But okay, here we go. Yale study examines people in housing with substance use disorders. Let's see that. Uh, yeah, so drug and alcohol disorders among homeless veterans. Looked at the housing outcomes. I don't know if this is exactly going to be what I'm looking for. Let's see if we can find that recidivism. No, no relapse. No resit. No. Okay, well, let's look at a different study then. Drug rehab success rate statistics. Okay, this should be good. Even if it's just general and not specific to homeless people, we can imagine that homeless people will have a lower success rate. And that's probably true than the, the general public. Mm -hmm. Kills a lot of people. Self-assessment. Relapse after completing treatment. I guess relapse is better than recidivism in a search term. Mm -mm -mm. So there's about 25% success rate among the general population in reducing alcohol intake for more than a year. Uh, let's see, addiction in a chronic condition Addiction is a chronic condition, so for some, relapse or return to drug and alcohol use is part of the process. Uh, relapse is not an indicator of failed treatment. It means that the individual needs to contact the physician to resume treatment. Okay, well, that's, that's not very helpful. I think relapse is probably a better... Okay, so here's an important stat. 33% report suggests that 33% of homeless people battle mental illness of any kind. So about uh, one in three. I don't know what that's about. Substance abuse. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's strange. Thirty percent. Oh, oh. So the 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 mental illness problem is much higher in women than men. So another important stat. So due to trauma and stuff like that, some are escaping sex trafficking, domestic violence. Um, one third of homeless women have abused heroin and crack cocaine. Well, that's very narrow. So seventy one percent of homeless youth have a substance problem. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm not finding exactly what I'm looking for. Hey, Natalie, how you doing tonight? Looking at a terrible PragerU documentary. So nobody's getting clean. Well, we haven't found any, any quick information that says otherwise. But 
he's obviously not putting up his claim with anything backing it. Make it easier to get high and so hard to get treatment in San Francisco that it hurts and it's literally killing people. How does, again, how does having clean paraphernalia make it harder to get treatment? You cannot connect those dots. That doesn't make any sense at all. No one is, is choosing. No one is, is saying, well, because I have clean needles, I'm now not going to get treatment. And no one, is, no one likewise would say there is no availability of clean needles. So I will get treatment instead. That, that those two things just don't line up in any meaningful way. In 2019, the city saw a 70% increase over 2018 in overdose deaths. This, I think I did see this part earlier. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to change the opacity of the closed captionings. Because these are, these are very strange stats that they're throwing up here. It's difficult to suss out what they're really saying. So I'm going to make it a little bit easier to see so let's change it to that and let's see if let's see if that helps so anyway we're looking at san francisco overall death toll i don't know what the bottom bar is deaths and during the pandemic san francisco went so far as to deliver free okay let's try and figure that one out again the city saw a 70% increase over 2018 in overdose deaths. Okay, so here's here's the 2018 overdose deaths. There's not a number assigned to it. It could have been 12. So no way of knowing how much of a, a, a systemic problem it is because they're not putting any numbers on the, the, the side. You're just giving a bar and then putting another bar on top of it without labeling what any of those numbers actually are other than a 70% rise. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I think I changed the wrong settings on the subtitles too. Oh yeah, it's background opacity that I wanted to change. Or opacity. Hopefully that's a little easier to see now. And during the pandemic, San Francisco went so far as to deliver free drugs and alcohol to homeless. Okay. San Francisco delivers alcohol, tobacco, and weed. Not heroin, but... Or fentanyl or any of the other stuff that they're, you know, having a moral panic about, but weed... Alcohol's not great, but let's... Okay, so in quarantined... Addicts quarantined in, in hotels. So hope, these are people that are probably going through... Who would go through withdrawals if they didn't have alcohol. Weed? I don't, I don't know. I guess just because it's, it's legal and it's not exactly harmful. And then tobacco. It's not good for you, of course, but <laughs> it's not going to increase... Um, Addictive behavior. Alcohol is the one that, that, you know, why are you giving alcohol to alcoholics? But usually the case ends up being that it's, uh, that it's because otherwise they would die from withdrawal. Let, let's, let's, let's try and find that. Let's hunt down that headline that they couldn't even bother linking. So... They claimed, they, they claim is San Francisco, SF delivers alcohol, tobacco, and weed to addicts quarantined in hotels. Let's see if we can find that from the AP. SF delivers alcohol. Oops. Uh, To, what was the rest of it there? To addicts quarantined in hotels. Let's 
See what we can find. TLA. Here's one from the AP. It's probably the one. It's not the, exactly the same title. Probably pretty close to the one that they're citing. So this is from May 6, 2020. San Francisco gets alcohol, tobacco for addicts and hotels. Okay. That's obviously not a hotel that they're showing in the picture, but whatever. San Francisco is using private donations to deliver alcohol, tobacco, and medical marijuana. So, another thing that they omitted, medical marijuana, not just recreational, to a, few dozen, uh, <laughs> to a few dozen people. They make it seem like they're just, you know, dealing to the entire city, but it's a few dozen people. Dealing with addiction as they isolate or quarantine in city-leased hotel rooms during the pandemic, officials confirmed Wednesday. There are about 270 people, mostly homeless, staying in hotel rooms uh, to recover from COVID-19 or to wait out possible exposure to the virus. Nearly a dozen people have received alcohol and more than two dozen people have received tobacco, the SF Chronicle reports. Doesn't say yet how much of any of this stuff, but anyway. City officials say that private donations pay for the items and that helping manage nicotine, opioid, and alcohol cravings ensure that recovering people don't go out and possibly infect others. Oh, so they're, they're, they're trying to do the lesser of two evils again. They're, they're, they're going for harm reduction. They're saying it would be worse if because of these people's addictions, even if it's something like tobacco, that they went out and potentially exposed more people to COVID-19. Wow. And this is May 2020, so the, the vaccine had just started rolling out. I believe, or, or, or May 2020, that is. So the vaccine, yeah. Oh, no, wait. It, we didn't even have a vaccine at that point. So it didn't come in until 2021, right? So, yeah, no vaccine at this point, high, like the height of the pandemic. And they're giving a little bit of, of these products to people, these substances to people, so that they don't go out and spread infection, potentially. Wow. What, what a horrible course of action. They should have just let them suffer and probably go out and infect people. At least then we'd be morally consistent, right? All right, let's move on. Staying in hotel rooms that the city paid for. What happens when a city plays drug dealer? In 2020, the death rate among San Francisco homeless doubled. So a, a dozen people, a, they, they, gave, they gave alcohol to a dozen people. If the San Francisco homelessness death rate doubled and it was entirely due to this program, that would mean 24 people died in the city due to, uh, and wait, death rate amongst, is this the entire death rate? Yeah, it, I mean, that is actually how they're framing it. They didn't say, hold on. Many of these lives could have been saved. We know how to fix this problem. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So in the height of the pandemic, before there was a vaccine, the homeless death rate doubled. And they're pinning this all on giving a little bit of alcohol, tobacco and weed to a couple dozen people in the city not to the pandemic that was ravaging the entire country at that time. Uh, that's, that's really, uh, that's pretty egregious, that, that error of omission. And they, they, they always do this. They, they play with this. They take this statistic that, that, that they think bolsters their point or makes their point look, or their narrative look the best. And they just run with that, whether or not it actually tells the whole story, whether or not there's some, maybe some mitigating circumstances like a pandemic that could be the cause of, of what they're talking about. And they just they casually speculate that it's due to a couple dozen people getting some tobacco, alcohol, and medical marijuana during the pandemic. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The, whole, the, the homeless rate of, of COVID deaths was higher everywhere because... Uh, these people are living on the streets, so they're, they're dealing with other morbidities 
uh, comorbidities. You know, so so it was high, it was higher everywhere. <laughs> you can't pin it all on these 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 few deliveries. That's absolutely ridiculous. No, let's just move on. And the good news is that leaders across the country are doing just that. I don't know. Oh, Homelessness is not an issue in California. It is the issue. When I first took is it took office, it quickly became clear to me that the search for consensus on the perfect thing to do was turning into non-action, not just here in the city, but up and down the entire state of California. I knew we had to do things differently. Allowing somebody to live on a sidewalk in our city streets is condemning them to die on the street. No, it's not if you try to get them housing. No, it's not. Just allowing them to continue living until where they are at, until you can find them a better place to live, is not condemning them to die. You know what is more likely to condemn them to die? Tearing down their, their few... Uh, uh, bits of, of possessions, throwing it all away, locking them in jail, or, or just pushing them out of the city. That's going to be much more of a hardship on these people. That was unacceptable. I do not allow tent encampments in San Diego on our sidewalks anymore. Every wow. individual... What, what, what a brave stand against people who, who have absolutely no other options at the time let, 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 let's target those people you know and, and i'm sure lo and behold there were less homeless encampments if you're going and breaking them up all the time does that mean that those people were getting housing well let's see if he even gets to that part of it has a right to shelter <laughs> if we provide that shelter <laughs> they have a right to shelter just not a right to shelter if all they have doesn't conform with city ordinances. <laughs> you have an obligation to use it. So I started a series of new bridge shelters in San Diego. It's a bridge between living on the street and being able to stand on your own two feet in that place on your own. Okay, so homeless shelters, well better than the street, are often not that much of a step up. It's basically just, you won't die of exposure. But most of the time, people are just completely exposed to other very desperate people who hurt one another. Uh, it gives them opportunities to steal each other's stuff and cause all kinds of other problems um, that, that you wouldn't have if you just put them into housing. So shelters are better than nothing. They're not better than housing. By any stretch so so saying oh i open up a bunch of extra homeless shelters eh, wow it, 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 that's that's actually not any better than just having homeless encampments i'm sure there's the same level of, of security and uh shelter just living in a tent especially if you're talking about san diego where it, it never dips below freezing i don't want you off the street for for a night or for a week, but we want to help provide a safe, clean, sanitary, and supportive environment to get you off the streets for good. You can also do that by giving them housing. You can do all those things he just mentioned, but then also give them a, a secure place of their own where they don't have to interact with other people if they don't want to. They don't have to worry about being attacked in the middle of the night. Uh, they have a place for their stuff where they know it's not going to be stolen. That's what housing gives you. That's not what shelters give you. And, and sometimes they, they provide lockers and, and, and short-term storage, but then there's always issues of like, well, what if someone doesn't come pick it up? Uh, what, what if you give the, the wrong stuff to the wrong person? There's all sorts of logistics and bureaucracy that just giving person an apartment would not entail. Ugh. Really, absolutely ridiculous. Mm. So Natalie says San, Fran San Francisco had one of the lowest per capita COVID-19 death rates uh, of any major city in, in 2020, according to what I've heard. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, my brother lives there and, and they were very strict on their lockdowns. People could not even really go outside 
except for I think they had like a, a one hour, you know, exercise period where they could uh, go outside. But otherwise, you had to have a good reason to be going someplace. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised at that. So, so again, just saying that the homeless death rate doubled under COVID. Yeah, it did everywhere. It did everywhere. <laughs> James says, burn the tents. Uh, and then they have nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, and that's, that's the goal. You, you just want them to go somewhere else. That, that has been the long-term solution for, for homeless problems from cities' perspectives for a long, long time. It's how can we make it difficult enough for them that they just move along somewhere else and we just dump our problem on other cities? That's, that's when you get policies like no tent encampments. That's when you get anti-homeless architecture, like the, the spikes under overpasses, that sort of thing. It's, it's just being that much more cruel in order to dump the problem on, on somebody else. It does not in any way address homelessness. It does not stop one person from being homeless to do these sorts of things. Natalie says they need to treat the mentally ill and addicted along with providing housing. Absolutely. And, and again, that's what we, we found is the case for, for places such as, uh, we'll, we'll put up the, um, oh, wait, that's not the right one. Here we go. So here's, here's the Twin Cities Catholic Charities describing their, their housing first uh, homelessness alleviation program. Link that again in the chat. And that's exactly what they do. They, they first give them housing, which is why it's called housing first. And then they provide all the other resources for, for mental health care and addiction care, or, or if they don't themselves provide it, they link them to people that, that do, and they help provide transportation to alleviate their, you know, you know, avail themselves of these these services. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly what they do. And that is, that is the way that you end homelessness. That, is, that has been shown to be the most effective way to end homelessness, is to treat the entire person and all of their needs, not force them to jump through hoops, not force them to prove themselves to be the worthy poor, to just give them the stuff and help stabilize them. That, that has been shown to be the best. All right. Getting back to the video. So this guy's talking about, yeah, supportive environments to get you off the streets for good. Good, but also give them secure places of their own. If That's you've better. got a need, you're willing to work together, we can fix things 90% of the time. Yeah, oh, there's that little bit of it there that, that you don't deserve it unless you're going to prove to me that you are willing to work together with it. So... If you're not ready to kick your addiction, Mr. Homeless Man, guess where you get to stay? Uh, if you're lucky, in the shelter. Otherwise, just back on the streets. But you better not camp there, because we'll kick you out of the city. We'll move you right along. Um, or we'll just throw you in jail. That, that, that's their attitude there. I hate that. If you're willing to work together, we can fix things 90% of the time. Putting it all on them. Putting it all on them. You need to demonstrate to me that you're worthy. You're the worthy poor. Not not some deadbeat, not some layabout, but the worthy poor who's willing to change your ways and show that you can be a productive member of society once again. I hate that framing. And I hate people that, that look at things that way. It's absolutely cruel and, and inhuman. Before we had the, the bridge shelters, people had no choice. And that's why the, the judges, they wouldn't enforce the policy because there was no alternative to being homeless because there was no place to start the process to get off the street. Again, just give them housing. Just because you have a shelter, you, you don't, you know, don't pat yourself on the back too hard. All this stuff would work and work better by giving them housing first. Everybody drank the housing first Kool-Aid, which I knew there was a city council meeting and they said, we're not going to do shelters anymore because we're going to do housing first. And I said, on camera with all the new Jays outside, this is going to be a disaster because now people don't have any place to go. They have the housing first. Did you? What? What? This is like the idea that landlords somehow produce, provide housing. If, if we didn't have landlords, there would be no housing. As though these places wouldn't get built either way. 
people don't people don't have another place to go they just were talking about the other place to go housing first that other place is housing <laughs> what if homeless people didn't have shelters they would have no other place to go oh, oh how about housing well, you know if we did housing first they, then you know they got no alternative they, they don't have a place to go because they don't have a shelter homeless people have to have shelter like what why where's the logic in this guy's brain i'm not i'm not seeing any of it wow we, what are we what are we gonna do if we don't build shelters we're gonna give them housing Wow, man. Ah, <laughs> wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, James says if the police arrest them for trespassing, are they homeless or criminal? Well, I mean, they're criminalizing homelessness, basically, too. It, it's a way to, it's an extra way to criminalize homelessness. So beyond, you know, loitering laws and, and, uh, vagrancy laws and and all this other stuff. It's yet another law that they can put on the books to harass homeless people. No, no camping. Now people, <laughs> housing first is a disaster because now people don't have any place to go. What? <laughs> they have housing to go to. To wait for that housing that may or may not ever come. So you can take. <laughs> so sure have the, if you really have to have a stopgap sure you can still use the the shelters you have but the, why would it have to be all of one or all of the other in that case if they got no place to go to wait for the the, the housing to become available um sure put them in 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 shelters uh, but keep on building more housing <laughs> like Again, where's the logic in this? That he wants them to just be in shelters. Where are they going to go when they get out of the shelter then? Uh, uh. Look at the billions and billions and billions of dollars being wasted right now in communities like Seattle, Portland, LA, San Francisco, San Jose. Billions of dollars by allowing people to kill themselves publicly. Where you what does that mean? What, what are the billions of dollars being spent so people can kill themselves publicly? How does that in any way tie into a housing first policy? You could take that same money and invest in people on the street and say, you're better than this. That is what housing first means. That is, it says you are better than, than having to be in a shelter. It says you are, are, are worth more than having to prove that, that you deserve housing before you can get it. It's, we're going to do our best to get as much housing as possible for the people that need it the most. Um, that's investing in those people. This guy's, this guy's, uh... Bridge shelters are no, so much more than a shelter. Housing navigation. How do we match you with resources to get that apartment of your own? Dealing with mental health and substance abuse issues. Deal yep, again, housing first policies deal with all that stuff too. They, they connect people with all that stuff. There's, there's no reason you can't have it that way and only use shelters as, as a last resort, a stopgap measure, if there's not other better stuff available. Deal with job training issues. Bringing job training as though that's all it is. As, as though people end up uh, homeless because they don't know how to get or hold down a job. Because they probably just had a bad resume. That, that's it, you know. They, 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 they put all of their, their fonts in Comic Sans. Um, they, they forgot to, to put on their, their college experience. And that's, that's the reason that they couldn't get a job and ended up on the street. Well, let's just give them some, some resources to uh, figure out how, <coughs> how to interview better and write a better resume. That'll, that'll probably solve the, the problem. But again, I, I, I have to keep on saying it. You can do any, anything that he lists here. It doesn't matter what the program is or how effective it, it ends up being. You could still all do that and have a housing first policy. There's nothing stopping that. There's nothing mutually exclusive about offering these resources and putting people into public housing as soon as you possibly can. All of those services underneath one location one of then, so they're contradicting themselves from earlier because earlier in the video 
they're big, uh, they're big, uh, gotcha against the housing first policy. It was, they, they, they said that they just want to get people all into one place. Um, so they could end up back on the street again or something like that, or so they could watch them or something like that. And here he is saying, Oh no, no, our policy, we want to get everyone in the same place so that we can monitor. Them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I don't expect Prager to be even consistent in their arguments throughout an entire 23 minute video. Cause I mean, usually Prager videos are, are, you know, five, six minutes long and they still manage to contradict themselves most of the time. So pretty, pretty good job to be 15 minutes in and this be the first major, major contradiction <laughs> from their arguments earlier. One of the changes that I made was establish a series of storage centers for personal belongings. Free of you, you know what those storage facilities could also be? An, an apartment. Um, it can be an apartment. <laughs> You would have to have separate facilities, actually make it a little bit more useful for the people that you're trying to serve. If they could keep all their stuff where they, where they were living, like like right in their their own apartment. Charge, it has allowed our streets to be much cleaner. Mm. Again, it was the right thing. To mm. do. They just had to put that little dig in there, didn't they? Our streets are cleaner because those damn dirty homeless people are up off of them. Out of sight and out of mind. Uh, yeah, th th these people have no compassion for the people that they're supposedly trying to serve. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. Do by changing that dynamic, providing the incentive to do the right thing but also the consequences if you do the wrong thing. Mm, mm, we, mu we must have consequences. That's the thing. They want to punish homeless people. This is, this is at the bottom of all this stuff. They want them, they want the homeless people to know that they don't deserve this stuff, that they've made some really bad decisions and they've been super naughty about it. And that's the reason they're in this predicament. So if they don't straighten up and fly, fly right, young men and women uh, and NB pals, um, you're going to wind up in the same position again. So you better follow our set of hoops and jump through each one as we tell you. Otherwise, you're going to be right back where you deserve to be. So you should be glad that we've provided this opportunity for you. Uh, this is this is precisely the reason they're doing these pro these programs. So they can, so that when the homeless people inevitably fail in, in a much greater rate than if they had a housing first policy, they can blame them. It can be an individual failure yet again. So then they don't have to think about that. It doesn't matter how much of a success rate our, our program has because the right homeless people get helped. The ones that really deserve it, not those ones that are just like, you know, sneaking under the radar, you know, pretending to, to try and better themselves, but then not really in the long run. The right homeless people instead get it. So that, that, that's the way that they are framing all of this. Moving on. I'm proud that we're the only urban county in California where homelessness has gone down the last two years. Uh Notice the framing of that yet again. We are the only county, the only urban county in the state of California where homelessness has gone down. He did not say where we have gotten ho the most homeless people off of the streets and into permanent housing. He said homelessness has gone down. You know how homelessness can go down when you're destroying camps and, and running people um, out of their meager shelters and taking all of their stuff and shuffling them into uh, um, homeless shelters that they may not feel are, are any safer than the, the streets. You know how homelessness can go down because of all that? It's because people go other places then. Again, the entire the entire thing is help the right homeless people, and then if they can't make it, they're going to be back out on the streets, and we're going to make it as difficult as possible for them to be back out on the streets. So likely they're just going to go somewhere else. 
and it'll become some other place's problem. Now, if this was a, su a successful program, then number one, the number one thing he would be touting is look at all the people who we've helped cure homelessness of. You know, look at all the people that that used to be homeless that we have now provided the means and 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 it has it has resulted in them getting up off the street permanently. But he's not saying that. He's saying we've reduced homelessness. It's a little bit of sleight of hand there in the way he's wording things. Um, and, and there's nothing more I like than to interact with somebody who maybe was a skeptic of what we were doing in terms of putting up a bridge shelter or the help and support that we're given. They come back to me and say, Mr. Mayor, you know what? This worked out pretty well. San Diego reduced its unsheltered homeless population by more than 20% in recent years. In recent years, is that 10 years? Is that five years? Is that have anything to do with the programs that he's talking about? This, this, this what, what did he call it? The bridge shelters? How much have they reduced it since putting in the, the bridge shelters? I would bet. <laughs> Let's see if we can even find something on that. Homelessness in... San, uh, San Diego. Let's look. So here we go. NBC San Diego. Homelessness or homeless in San Diego, annual count of homeless beings. So most of the people who are homeless in San Diego became homeless while living in San Diego, 85%. Uh, preliminary data also show shows 21% of the homeless surveyed were female, and there appears to be a troubling increase in homeless over the age of 55. Hmm. Sounds like it hasn't gone down, at least not for any every demographic. So, yeah, because of the pandemic, a lot of seniors ended up homeless. Um, 138 veterans were part of the count. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing the year-over-year -year statistics that I was hoping for. Let's see if we can find some sort of graph over time. Yearly. There we go. Okay. So as early as as late as February, uh, homelessness and in, in and despair appear to be rising on city streets. Partial county data shows drug overdose deaths also spiking among the homeless last year on sheltered and renewed calls or ushering in renewed calls for solutions street homelessness and the misery tied to it appear to be surging to new heights across san diego so it's not even true what he said or it may have been briefly but i mean i don't know when they interviewed him they must have been within the last couple of years though Oh, so here's another report. Number of new homeless people out in, in the county, the, that same county he was talking about, doubled in 2020. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, of course, a lot of this is going to be due to the pandemic as well. 
but still, he's he's saying that they've reduced homelessness. Doesn't kind of seem that that's the case. So, yeah, look at that. 2018, 2019, 2020. First time homeless people gone up quite a bit. In fact, almost... Uh, almost double the number of people from 2018 to 2020. Oh, so huh, I wonder if his numbers were in 2019 when it went down slightly. And this is just first time homelessness, not necessarily chronic, chronic homelessness either. But I'm sure they're pretty much tied together a lot. They probably rise and fall at about the same rate. Mm -mm. So yeah, so we don't even have to look very far to find out. Homeless population has been reduced by more than 20% in recent years. It sounds like that's just completely bogus to begin with. But also, if this is in the middle of the pandemic, that's, that's, also, that's gonna be the case across the country, so. Or that, that it went up, but he's saying it went down in recent years. Now, it, it, it just seems like a bunch of lies. <laughs> what does San Diego understand that its neighbors don't? That compassion must work with accountability. Yes, the compassionate uh, stance of destroying people's places of where they live, their, 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 their meager shelters, kicking them out of their homeless encampments. So, so compassionate, forcing them into um, homeless shelters, very compassionate, forcing them to jump through hoops in order to prove themselves the the worthy the worthy poor uh, and actually get to stabilization so compassionate uh, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous that is the opposite of compassion and that by banning street camping we can incentivize people to seek better opportunities back to the old days where you would have tent encampments uh, that was not helpful to the individuals obviously that were living on the streets it's not helpful for your neighborhoods, for your business. It's more helpful than just destroying that stuff and telling them to move along or saying your choice is to move along or come to this, uh, into this, uh, this bridge shelter, as he calls it. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's better. It's better to leave them alone than that. It's better still, better than all of those situations to just keep on providing more housing for for homeless and low-income people just provide it you know buy up low-income apartment buildings and turn them into public housing you don't even have to build new stuff necessarily you just have to find stuff that is is reasonably well maintained that the, the city's not gonna spend an additional um sum of money having to to rehab necessarily and then you just have the city buy it and then Whoa, you got new new low income housing. Just like that. Hundred you could be hundred percent section eight in that case. Uh, or it could just be all just given to people, you know? Uh, in recognition that they will be better contributing members of society, however you slice that term, by having to not worry about but by not having to worry about where they're going to live just taking away that that daily struggle and giving them a place to to live that is safe and has modern utilities and is not you know roach infested or whatever just doing that could give them a much better chance of becoming stabilized but then also also providing those those other city services um you can do it all <laughs> as a city, especially a city as large as as san diego they could uh, just start a, a process of decommodifying housing, or at least primary residencies. You know, leave a small chunk of the market for for speculation and and you know luxury accommodations and all that stuff. But just make sure that for everyone, you know that 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 and and again, here's another good statistic of where people are at. Um, financially in general 
Where was that one? Uh, that's not the one. Okay. Yeah, well, let me share this one. So this is National Low Income Housing Coalition. This is a report in 2021. Um, so I'll share that, that link in the chat. And we'll get back to it. So hourly wages by uh, percentile versus one two bedroom housing wages. So so the 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 lines there that this gold line here is the average wage that you need to to make in order to rent a one bedroom place. Up here above that is the average wage, um, and is this by a household or is it by individuals and that I'm not sure okay so it must be this must be individual wages that you need so if you're if you're a single person you have to make $21 an hour in order to afford a one bedroom place in in basically you know on average across the the country so that wouldn't even include very um, pricey housing markets like, oh, like San Diego or San Francisco. Um, and so 50% so of the, the wage earners make above that. So 50% of people make enough to, to rent a one bedroom apartment. That also means that 50% of people make below that. <laughs> that they don't make enough on their own to, to rent a one bedroom place. So that should just give you an idea of how precarious the situation is for people in general. So, so even taking homelessness out of the equation entirely, um, most people on their own could not afford a place to live. And that's a national tragedy that the government could do something about. Um, yeah, we could just say people deserve a place to live, one place to live. It doesn't have to be some, some huge luxury, you know, five bedroom, two story apartment or, or a huge mansion or anything like that. It could just be a one bedroom apartment with modern utilities that is on, you know, a, a physically stable, in a physically stable building uh, that is, you know, pest free, you know, ba basics, basic living standards, right? Everyone deserves that one bit because right now half of people couldn't afford that on their own which means that if you're making less than 21 dollars an hour um and, th and this is you know not including any sort of other debt that you have to service every month as this this would not even include having a car probably uh, built into that budget this is just going with the 30 percent um of your base income your gross income going towards housing how much you have to make in order to afford a, a one bedroom. So, so, so it seems like the, this system of capitalism is, is failing Americans is, is what I'm saying. And so we should then take a look at how we can alleviate that for that bottom 50%. Um, because they, they don't deserve to be out on the, the streets if they, don't if they aren't lucky enough to live with other people that, that's about it yeah we it doesn't even necessarily have to be subsidized housing like it doesn't have to be like housing vouchers or you don't have to necessarily force landlords to provide section eight you can just like i said cities have enough money especially larger cities they could just start buying up apartment complexes they could they could outsource the the management of it, or they could create a new housing department, uh, housing management department within a city, to to be the property managers for these places, but then just take that off of the market. You know, the idea is to to take that those bits of housing 
out of the marketplace. So they're not affected by market forces. So no matter how much, um, you know, real estate prices go up in the nearby area, it wouldn't affect this housing. That's the idea. And then if you're going to charge people anything, you charge them enough to maintain that, that structure, right? So if you have, you know, a 12 unit place, you charge each one of them one twelfth of what it takes to maintain that structure and nothing more just so they have that stable platform. That is, that, that is a real solution that you don't have to, you know, have public private partnerships for, um, it's just taking stuff out of the private market, realizing that, that housing should be a human right and acting accordingly. And then as, as needs arise, continue to buy more housing, take it out of the, the, the private market. Just keep doing that. We can just keep doing that pretty much indefinitely. Because all of that rent that they otherwise would be paying is then available to go into the local economy. So for that reason alone, it would be advantageous to just give people housing because now they're in, instead of servicing the, the, the lifestyle needs of, of people that are just lucky enough to be owners and in the, in the owner class of, of landlords, um, all that money is then going to everything else, <laughs> other basic necessities of life. Uh, or other luxury items as well, but but not to the the hands, not just into the hands of the the lucky few um, landlords who provide nothing and are somehow owed money. So so there's that to consider. Let's continue on with the the video here. That's the wrong approach. That's the failed status quo approach. If Housing first is not status quo. Every system that he talked about is the status quo. Just building more shelters. Uh, setting up all these, these hoops and, and stumbling blocks and barriers to people getting safe and, and affordable housing. That's the status quo. What the hell is he talking about? Housing first is 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 the new way forward. Uh, you can't even get that part right. If I was on the street and you'd come up to me when I was sitting there hitting my heroin on my foil, and they said, "Hey, hey if you said, hey, Tom, you want to go to rehab? Do you have a drug problem?" And I would have my answer to you would have been, "What drug problem? I'm just chilling out here, man." That's what most people say. I agree with Mayor Faulkner on the. So you better force them into, we need to just treat homeless people like they're children that need to be told what to do. And if not, well, there's going to be consequences. That's the better alternative because that doesn't actually work. It has, a, it has a lower success rate than just offering that. That first thing that he said, Hey, do you want to go to rehab? That has a much higher success rate than if you were to smack the heroin out of his hand, haul him up by his shirt collar, and haul them off to, to rehab and say, so you have to go through rehab. And if you don't, if you fall off the wagon in any way, shape or form, we're going to send you right back here. Guess where it's going to happen. Guess what's going to happen uh, much more often than if you just offer it to him. He's going to end up falling off in some way because you're setting up all these artificial barriers and, and stumbling points. So that's just one more spot where someone could get back into homelessness. If you just give them housing, then even if they're struggling with all that other stuff, they're not going to end up back up on the street, most likely, because they have a place to live, right? I don't see why this is such a difficult thing, that you're going to have more success keeping people homeless by giving them housing. It's, it's, uh, it's so simple that it, it seems stupid to even have to explain that. But uh, it's just, obviously, obviously, if you give someone a place to live they're going to be less likely going to end up back on the street. And if you don't put conditions on them continuing to have that place to live, um, other than, you know, you can't be violent towards your neighbors or whatever, like, like you would have in any sort of housing situation. But as, as long as they are doing what any normal tenant would do and staying within those guidelines, then, 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 then there's no way that they can be ending up homeless. Then of course you're going to have a much lower, homelessness uh, relapse rate. 
It's just so ridiculous. Issue of street camping and that so long as we have a shelter bed that we can offer them, they should be obligated to take that shelter bed. <laughs> so yes, treat them, treat them like children is what he's saying. Uh, they're clearly unable to make their own decisions in life because they've made bad ones. And so now we need to beat them over the head with uh, pushing them towards the right decision um, and then send them back to where they came from if they resist in any way or if they have any other ideas of how they would like to get their life back together. Again, treat people like individuals, but impose one-size-fits-all systemic solutions. That's what he's advocating right now. He's, on the one hand, people should be looked at as individuals, but on the other hand, they're, they're all children. They're all bad decision makers, and they all need to be just given some tough love, love and uh, um, push towards making the decision that we think is best for them. At least for a day or two. Right, to just try it, what it's like getting off the street. In Austin, some individuals are taking action into their own hands. And Alan Graham believes there's a better approach. <laughs> I saw it on his little golf cart there. It said MLF.org. I wonder how much uh, unintended traffic he gets from people looking for others, <laughs> other services than stuff you provides. We believe very powerfully that government should only play a subsidiary role to you and I in mitigating these profound human needs that our society explores. Why? Why? Why can't that be what government is for? For, for helping people? Uh, why does it have to be this, 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 you know, foreign entity that's coming in and, and meddling and stuff? Why can't it just be programs to help people? There's, no, there's nothing inherently better about these services being private. In fact, it's probably worse because if it's private, it has to make a profit, which means that only the people that are most likely to succeed are going to get into the programs and stay in the programs. Because otherwise they they end up being dead weight to the program. They don't show this the the statistics enough that they're successful to warrant people donating to them or getting the dollars. However, they do. Uh, this is just his belief. Again, it's just his feelings. He feels that that it's better for government not to try and help people. Okay, that's that's just your feelings. What we want to do is encourage people to move out of that, that transactional mentality that we're going to go build, you know, $600 billion worth of housing over here, and we're going to put people in there, and it's going to solve this housing problem. No one is saying that. No one is saying that. That's housing first is, is not housing only. It is, it is housing plus services. Services that government can provide. No problem. Much more often, the government is going to be a much larger and, and well-endowed entity than any single charity in the same area. So, in most cases, the government is in a much better position to provide help to a lot of people. And you don't have to have the, the housing all in one place either, as, as we looked at with the, the Catholic Charities in, in Minneapolis. They have housing sites all over the place so that people can live where they're at. They just have a house instead of being on the street. So he's, he's, he's making all kinds of assumptions that are baseless. It's not. The people that we serve here are the hardest to house. The average age of the people who live here is 58 years old. The average length of time on the streets is 10 years. These are folks that genuinely, they never thought they would get off the streets. They were certain that, that they would be on the streets until they died. What we believe is that the forged family has to come around them, right? That it is all of us. And what happens in our culture today is that we've abdicated responsibility for that to the government. And we've said, city hall, state government, federal government, this is your problem to solve. Why is that 
any better or worse than what she's talking about. Because it's a government service that it can't be carried out with compassion, the same compassion that she's talking about. It can't, you can't have the, build the same connections with these people because it's coming from the government. That makes absolutely no sense. This only makes sense if you just are knee-jerk anti-government intervention. And if you put the government as some sort of separate entity above and beyond the people, but the government should be the people, right? <laughs> Isn't that supposed to be what our system is? Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing inherently better about her program versus a government program. And it's not. It's a human problem. It's all of us. Governments can't solve human problems? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. When you decide on one way, you're limiting innovation. And Says the, the program that has one way of going through it. What are you talking about? You're limiting innovation. Uh, the, yeah. And that's really what's happened. Community First, the movement, is an innovation. Lots of people thought that this model could never work. We continue to invest in relationship. We continue to show up for each other. And it turns out that community actually does work. It turns out that government can help build communities. <laughs> government is not just like a computer program. It is made of people often which who are there to try and help people with their problems. Uh, so, yeah, governments can be instrumental in helping to build a community. Governments are really good at, at destroying communities through listening to private interests that, that want to build more roads that separate people, that want to uh, have a certain style of housing that separates people. You can have plenty of government policies that, that break apart communities. Um, there's no reason you couldn't have the opposite, though. Policies that help bring communities together, that help people reintegrate into communities. Nothing says you couldn't do that. In fact, they do that in other countries with public housing. But Natalie says, uh, years ago, left a treatment center with a similar attitude. It approaches a giant turnoff for many people. Push, and there's going to be a big pull in the opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah, so you say you left treatment with a similar, a similar attitude that, what? Um, I guess I'm, I didn't see when that comment came up, so I'm not sure exactly which part it's referring to. But, yeah, let's continue. Community First Village gives homeless individuals something housing for... Community First Villages. As though that's different than, than Housing First. First policies can never... What? <laughs> What's this? This is a charity. This is a charity. It is 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 a non-governmental entity, but it functions the exact same way that a government entity does in terms of of its ability and its approach to services. Uh, <laughs> this, there's nothing about a charity that that makes it more inherently community oriented. That's silly. <laughs> Yeah, you can build housing communities with government subsidies or with government money directly. This is, this is, this is just feels. Again, this is just feelings. Government, faceless, cold, bad, uh, charity, warm, good, community. That, that doesn't line up with reality, though. People holding each other accountable, supporting each other. It's, it's it, yeah, accountability, <laughs> accountable. There's that, that punishment part of it coming right By back. By providing in. a sustainable before and after. So there's there's been a, a, a uh, ninety percent drop in in alcohol rates after getting into this community. That that's great. For these individuals to thrive in, addiction, alcohol use, and other harmful behaviors have plummeted. That that that's cool. Cool. I, there's for one thing, there's no timeline on this, so that's that's a big red flag to that data right away. Um, also, do you bring somebody? All right. Well, do you back up? 
Providing a sustainable system for these individuals to thrive in, drug addiction, alcohol use, and other harm. So for another thing, they're not comparing it to Housing First programs. So we don't know. When you just throw up statistics that are not related to the alternative, that doesn't really say anything about how effective a program could be. Um, for another thing, uh, do they count the people that they kick out of the program? Uh, who and, and how many of people are even in this program versus a housing first program? We don't know any of these numbers because they're just it, we're I just we're just supposed to believe that good good good, and and clearly the alternative would be bad bad bad. Harmful behaviors have plummeted. How do you bring somebody into purposeful living? And when you look at what's happening inside this community, what they're being given is a community, uh, organic farming operation, a blacksmithing shop, a wood shop, an art house, all the things that allow people to wake up in the morning and have purpose. That sounds wonderful. Those sound like some great programs to help people make meaning out of their life and um, build more positive change into, into their, the trajectory of their life. That sounds great. Nothing says we couldn't have all those same things just because it would be funded by a government program or, or be a government program. You could do all that same stuff and also have it be government housing. There's nothing stopping it. Uh, they're just treading on the, the, the history of, of poor government housing decisions, of just sticking people into mass housing without thinking of community development whatsoever, um, of creating conditions that were inherently inviting more violence to happen in public housing um, through poor, poor assumptions and poor planning. But there's nothing that has that says it has to be that way and probably going to run out of time tonight but i think in the in the next the next time we we get together so so next weekend it'll be dan platt from the three left show again we're going to do more on local organizing but then two weeks from now um why don't we look at the other side of this equation here of what real good housing first programs look like see if maybe we can see some of the same elements that he's talking about in government programs and we're gonna look at we'll look at you know from around the world too we won't just look at the US purpose well there's rules to live here you must pay rent and do you know that we don't have a rent collection problem here and never have because everybody knows that they must pay rent what what does that mean you don't have a rent collection program does that problem does that mean that people that don't pay rent get kicked out so that's no problem for you anymore <laughs> What? Uh, so, uh, Blatt says, I'm still stuck on the them saying a blacksmith shop helps get me up to get me up in the morning. Well, I, I don't know. I guess it's just, you know, providing uh, uh, opportunities for people to find meaning in their lives. And that, that's fine. I, I have nothing against any of the programs that they're talking about. Having them do community gardening. That, that's great. That's that's a a wonderful way to build community, to, to reconnect people with meaning in their life, to reconnect people to the, the land and the soil and all that stuff. That, that's wonderful stuff. But I keep saying it, there's nothing that's stopping a government program from being the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, you'd love to have your own foundry. It's just a, such a strange argument in the modern day. Yeah, well... Um, <laughs> they're, they're 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 pretending that this is this is all unique to what it what a charity can do and that that a government program couldn't possibly have the same care and compassion for people and that's just bullshit <laughs> um ah before i move on though i want to mention that my my background right here tonight is um where is uh the link to that uh, this is an affordable housing complex in Vienna, Austria. So it looks pretty nice, doesn't it? I mean, there's, there's you know, 
green stuff dripping off all the balconies. It, uh, it looks like a modern design. It's not just a square gray box. Um, and in fact, inside this, I've, I've seen a video on this, which I'll try to find again for next time. Um, I'll even link to, to this particular article that I got it from. It's nice. They have uh, uh, exercise facilities. They have community centers. All sorts of things. This is this is how Vienna does government housing. Um, there's connections to mass transit. There's opportunities for community gathering. It's pretty cool. And hey, guess what? It's it's all funded by the government too. Imagine that. <laughs> uh. So so the it's the background. Um, there's the there's the link for it. You can go look at that article on your own. But <laughs> it's amazing what, what what you can do when you actually have compassion for um, homeless and low income people. Uh, it doesn't have to be cold and gray just because it's coming from the government. That's that's a complete myth. All right, so let's move on in the video. We're almost done here. When you pay rent, turns out that you're invested. You have skin in the game, and every human needs to have skin in the game. This is a stupid, bullshit, conservative myth. Uh, people can certainly care about things that they're not paying for. Um, children don't pay rent to their <laughs> their parents, usually. Um, but they're not destroying their housing and, and ending up on the street most of the time. Uh, this is stupid. And, and I mean, you could even charge them the rent that, that it costs to upkeep the place, which would be pretty, pretty nominal as long as they have a job. Um, that, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with that sort of a, a scheme, but even if you didn't charge them anything, they're, they're not just going to destroy it all. The only reason you assume it, that, that you would assume it would is if you just believe they're inherently bad people that make bad choices and destroy everything that they get their hands on. Um, so that's silly. And that is what is lacking uh, out there on the streets. Incentives and accountability work. The Dell Fund in New York... Wait, wait, wait. wait incentives you were if, through this whole video they've been talking about forcing forcing people into to treatment programs forcing them into shelters forcing them to to maintain sobriety now we're talking about incentives uh, that again they're, they're all over the map in their their actual thesis uh i i don't actually know which one they they prefer because incentives is is if you do this, we'll help you out this way. But that could be, here's some housing. If you go into treatment, we will, we will help you find some next steps um, to, to stabilize yourself. Or, or you know, if you get the, these mental health services, we will reward you in some way. You could certainly do that. <laughs> but what they want is not incentives, it's, it's, it's force. What, what, what the, the people in this documentary want is, is to force people to make the decisions. Otherwise, they end up on the street again. And that's what they mean by accountability. Oh. New York City has transformed tens of thousands of lives through its Ready, Willing, and Able program, which combines paid work, transitional housing, and comprehensive social services, including sobriety support. An independent study by Harvard University found that ready, willing, and able graduates are 60% less likely to be convicted of a felony three years after exiting the program. Okay, they got these stupid stats that aren't, that only have no, that don't even have, it's not even a proper bar graph. They're not measuring anything. What, what, are, they, what are they measuring? 60% less? What is the rate of the comparison group? Uh, this is this is ridiculous. Who is the comparison group? Who are they, they comparing it to? Let's let's look at this ready, willing, and able.
Okay, so here is the, here's the program they're talking about. Let's take a look at it. Put the link in the chat too. Well, that, that's a good point too, Blad. Renting doesn't mean you're invested because you have zero ownership. You get nothing out of the deal. You just get to keep living there and not getting kicked out, but you're not building equity or anything. Uh, that's ridiculous. Good, good, good catch there. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's the, the program we're looking at right now. Ready, willing, and able. The Doe Fund. Uh, provides a working way home for men. I guess it's not even women or non-binary people with long histories of incarceration, homelessness, and unemployment. So they, it's not even just a, for homeless people either. It's already kind of mischaracterizing what we're t talking about, especially if you're looking at their... Uh, So they're less likely to be convicted of felony three years after exiting the program. But that's not just homeless people. That's also ex-cons and um, what, they, what else do they say? Uh, just unemployed people. So that's a bunch of people lumped into. So you're not even just looking at a homelessness, anti-homelessness program. But of course, Prager U does this. So of this 12 month, it's only a 12 month program too. Residential program is paid work, complemented by holistic social services, career and workforce development training, uh, continuing education and sobriety support. It doesn't say mandatory on any of those things, but it might be, I guess we'll, we'll read on to see. It is the first program to combine paid work with comprehensive supportive services to help disenfranchised men ascend the economic ladder. Ready, willing, and able represents a core component of the spectrum of care the Doe Fund offers to New Yorkers in need. I don't know what the Doe Fund is either. Look at that too. The Men in Blues is as the Men in Blue participants in the program are known for their bright blue uniforms, have faced extraordinary hardships, but are determined to improve their lives. Since the program began in 1990, thousands have graduated from Ready, Willing, and Able with their sobriety, a full-time job, and a permanent home. That, that, that's good. I'm not saying these are, are necessarily bad things, but a uh, uh, pioneer of the Work Works model, Ready, Willing, and Able, has been replicated or scaled in six communities across the United States. So it just says a full-time job too. It doesn't say a good full-time job. It doesn't say a job where you could, that you could live off of in New York, which has a pretty expensive housing market. It's a job and, and sobriety. Okay. Hmm. All right. So they have to commit to change the decision to end the decision to enter the program uh, means making a commitment to change. On day one, participants begin earning a paycheck through in-house work assignments. While they adjust the program's demands, so they, they're given a, a job working in the facility. Case managers work one-on-one -on -one with participants to orient them, assess their needs, and set goals. So they're given housing on day one, though too. Kind of sounds to me like a housing first program. <laughs> what? Weird. They're holding this up as a model. It doesn't say a shelter, does it? It says, uh, it says the, the in-house work assignments, they adjust the program's demands, uh, including selection, selecting occupational training and education tracks. Eh. In turn, participants commit to maintaining their sobriety. Oh, so, okay, so there's a hoop to jump through, which means if you fall off, probably, then you're out of the program. So back to homeless. <laughs> just just the by the percentage of people that can't uh, commit to that, that level of sobriety, you're going to have more people out of the program than if you didn't have that as a hurdle. 
but okay. Let's let's continue. Um, participants commit to maintaining their sobriety and paying any owed child support. Okay. Uh, they begin a curriculum of evening classes and courses that last the duration of the program. Cool. Including financial management, parenting, and general education. Uh, months two and four, after long histories of homelessness and incarceration, re-entering the community and the workforce is difficult and intimidating. Months two through four, ready, willing, and able, introduce paid off-site work to accelerate earnings and savings. Yeah, okay, you're going to get a lot of savings with the kind of jobs that they're doing, I'm sure. Uh, and address social and soft skill deficits. The men in blue earn their nickname in bright blue uniforms. So, I mean, they're, they're doing, you know, janitorial work, it looks like, working in, in bakeries and probably factories as well. Entry-level stuff, anyway. Not the kind of stuff that you make even enough money to live on, but whatever, we'll continue on. Working in teams to beautify New York City streets and sidewalks along the way, they build self-esteem, teamwork skills, and their savings. In the evenings, the men in blue engage in intensive computer and educational classes, learning skills, critical in the modern workplace. Cool. So five through eight, months five through eight, they build a career. In this third phase, they choose an occupational training track based on their interests, ambitions, and abilities. I'm guessing they have a limited number of tracks that, that are available to them, so not a whole lot of... Uh, choice in that but but okay they they transition out of street cleaning teams and join paid full-time training opportunities with the doe funds social enterprises so they're just working this, this is all just a way to get a whole bunch of very low paid employees into it, it sounds like they're all working for this program um or or other programs that are funded by this doe fund so it sounds like a way to get a constant stream of, of really cheap labor. Because uh, it doesn't mention anything about what they're paid, if they're paid a living wage. Uh, and if they're not touting that, I'm guessing it's not. <laughs> uh, in the evenings, they take classes, sharpen their job search skills, learn how to write resumes, cover letters, yeah, yeah. So 9 through 12, they secure independence in the final months of the program. They work closely with the housing specialists to, and career coaches to secure full-time employment and permanent housing, two of the critical, two of the criteria required to graduate from Ready, Willing, and Able. Successful graduates receive earnings, supplemental grants, post-graduation to ease their transition. Wait, but if they're getting stable careers and stuff, why do they need extra supplemental money? Are they not making enough in these new careers to support themselves? We stay in touch with alumni, providing career development opportunities, temporary employment, and education advancement support to those who need it, which is why at our annual mission ceremony you'll find you'll often hear you'll often hear among the cheers, Doe Fund for Life. Okay. So the results. <sighs> So six months after employment, after, <laughs> this is not even that great. Six months after, after they graduate the program, 78% have a job. And that's only six months after the, this is a 12 month program. So six months after 78% of them are still employed. <sighs> Reduction in felony convictions. That's that 62%. Three years after graduating. Okay, I know that's that's great. Just not committing crimes is kind of a low bar to to set for long-term stabilization. Okay, well, I'm I'm pretty underwhelmed by this program. I'll put it that way. Uh, Natalie says they should be able to to at minimum do rent to own. Absolutely true. <laughs> Just giving more money to landlords is never going to be a good solution. 
Oh, thanks for the follow, armed with my opinions. Uh, the way they administer the program seems ineffective and seems to lead back into homelessness. Yeah, that, right. If only, if not even, if only four out of five people, six months out of the program, so that says nothing about, you know, a year out of the program or even longer term than that. If, they, if that's the best stats they can come up with is that six months out of the program, 80% of the people still have that job. Mm, that's not that great. <laughs> What about housing? It didn't even mention how many of them still have their housing after that. Uh, yeah, it, it does sound like a, a prison to society sort of transitional program. I don't know. That seems like a pretty weak program if, if they're holding that up as the model. Let's get back to the video. We're almost done. Researchers at the University of Alabama tested a similar hypothesis by providing homeless with housing conditioned upon drug and alcohol treatment they found that 64% of residents maintained sobriety. Instead of pumping billions of dollars into- As compared to what? How many people that, that didn't have that requirement maintained sobriety? That's again, a stat compared to nothing. What are you such bullshit? The housing first, it's time to use performance-based funding that rewards the programs that truly make a difference. You're not looking at which programs truly make a difference because you're, only showing the, 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 the outcomes of the, your preferred programs. You're not comparing it to Housing First programs. You haven't done it once in this entire video. If you really want, you know, data-driven policies, you should probably look at the, all the data. For the price of one housing unit in San Francisco, we could build dozens of transitional shelters or fund proven Weird. treatment programs. Meanwhile, our elected officials... Oh, so, so again, that, that housing stat that they, they listed. They're building housing at half the market rate in San Francisco. So, so housing, the average home is uh, like $1.3 billion or $1.3 million. They're getting housing units uh, for $600,000. Uh, but because that's higher than the national average, they, 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 they think that's somehow a failure. But, but okay. Must promote policies that address the root... What's that? Okay. Causes of homelessness. What I think everybody's aim should be. None of these people have looked at the, what the root cause of homelessness is, because none of them have said, why do they do these drugs in the first place? They've only said that drugs cause homelessness. They've never gotten into what causes the drug use. So, yeah, I agree. We should look at the systemic causes of homelessness. Does homelessness cause drugs? And homelessness often causes drugs. Very good point, Amanda. It, having a traumatic life on the street often leads you to do drugs. So yeah, <laughs> let's look at the root causes. Why is this system of capitalism failing so many people? Is this self-sufficiency. We don't want people in this perpetual mm -hmm. cycle. We want financial independence. We want emotional independence. We want independence that's perhaps free of a substance that's keeping them down. <laughs> We always are told that me and Craig, we're not the most compassionate individuals in the world. We take the compassionate approach by making it happen for people. And making it happen also means sometimes telling them- These people even get told they're not compassionate. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm gonna keep doing the same thing I do. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Totally wrecked with facts. Um, no, but what we don't do is we don't give up on anyone. No matter what they do, how they do it, we're going to be there for them. That's what keeps us going and keeps us moving toward whether we have no money or not. We will still do this work. Homelessness is a humanitarian crisis, but there are I solutions. Agree. Yeah, like Housing First solutions. <laughs> By denying the solutions, we excuse ourselves from making hard choices that can transform lives. No, no. We should make those choices to transform lives. We just shouldn't do what they're talking about. We shouldn't put restrictions on who can be in the program based on them fulfilling our uh, uh, standards for what a, a upstanding person should be. It's easy to hand someone an apartment key and think that the problem is solved. No one is doing that. <laughs> it's hard work getting them to treatment. 
holding them accountable. Yeah, so instead of forcing them, it's more effective to provide the, the, the resource to them and let them make the decision for themselves. That's the most effective way to do it. So, so yeah. yeah. And helping them return to a productive, safe, and healthy life. Sure. But that work must be done if we truly care for the most vulnerable among us. It should be done, it must be done, and it must be done in a way that, that is the most effective, which is not uh, all these other programs they've talked about. It is Housing First. Thank you for watching this video. PragerU is doing a survey on the homelessness problem. What do you think? Please click the link to take our survey. Because that's going to mean anything. Thanks so much for your support. What, what, what do you think the, the results of that survey are going to be? People that, that tend to watch PragerU, what are they going to think? Oh, that's a really good idea. I, I, I'm going to bet it's going to be 99% in, in favor of whatever PragerU says. Yeah, it's for, for for dumb people that want to justify their lack of compassion. Yeah. And want to make themselves feel better by looking down on everyone, including those those liberal elites that want to just give keys to homeless people so they can have a safe place to live off street. I'm done with the video, so do you want your headphones? No? Yeah. Oh, you, you, you just want to have the look? Yeah. Okay. You have a big group tonight. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I got a raid from Idan Simpson early on, and that, that boosted my numbers a lot, so I, I'm thinking a lot more people are, are finding me tonight for whatever reason. So that's always nice. Yeah, a lot of people on, on Twitch will actually have enough people to raid this time. That'll be cool. So yeah, summing up, Housing First works. Uh, it is not housing only. It, it, no, no Housing First program is ever housing only. It always is housing, plus uh, we'll, we'll hook you up with some resources for all those things they were talking about to help you get off drugs. And uh, if, if that's something you struggle with, to help you with mental illness, if that's something you struggle with. Um, or to just help you meet your baseline needs so you can yeah. do the harder work of yeah. trying to get off drugs or As, trying to... Help with, help with medical things. Um, help with transportation issues, help with food issues, all that sort of thing. So it's it's always housing plus all that other stuff. Right. So so don't believe what PragerU says that it's it's housing only, because that's how they've been, made it out to be, the, this whole time. Um, and yeah, adding extra stumbling blocks to that 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 uh, journey is only going to make sure that more people stumble and fall out of the program. Right. It's like when the little kid lets come to school, if they haven't had good sleep or food or whatever, they're not going to work. Give them food, give them a nap, and they'll finally do something. Right. Right. It's like, it's like if you had kids that, that uh, um, you know, their, their parents couldn't afford to give them breakfast every morning, and so they mm -hmm. came to school hungry, and you're like, well, you need to... Um, we'll give you a, we'll give you the food that you need, but first you have to agree to keep your hands to yourselves and behave perfectly for the next hour, and then on and only then are we going to to give you that food. Like, what do you think is going to be the result most of the time? Trash. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna end up being bad because they're hungry and and they'll lash out and then they're not going to get food, which will make them more hungry, which will lash out even more, and like. It's, this is the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Putting all these preconditions is, is only a way to, to filter out the undeserving poor um, and make sure that those who are really committed to you know, having skin in the game and all these other phrases that they like to use throughout it. Um, oh, hi, Natalie. They do have a breakfast program this year. All kids get breakfast and lunch for free. Unfortunately, it is going away next year because COVID's all better. Ugh. So they don't feel compelled to comply with that. Or, I mean, they don't have the money. I don't know what the real reason is. Um, kindergartners always get to eat, though. Yeah. So, yeah. 
But I mean, it does make a huge difference. Even the people that work in the cafeteria, like it's so nice to not have to harass parents for money when students' accounts right. go negative and try to threaten them. Or dump their food right in front of them if they can't pay. Our school lets them keep it. That's good, because there are schools that will take your lunch and throw mm -hmm. it in the garbage in front of your eyes. My school used to do that, and then they'd hand me peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then I cry. So, that's so cruel. That's so fucking cruel. It is. It's like, what is the kid? How is the kid at fault for any of that? All the kid wants is food. Yep. And and, and like because I mean, of their parents' precarious situation, financially, you're gonna punish them and shame them in front of everyone. All that does is say that that you deserve to be hungry uh, because you are not worthy of this basic necessity of life. <laughs> It's incredibly cruel. Um, but yeah. If you guys want to go back and look at this... Why is this video page blank? I don't know what's happening. Stop sharing. Why isn't it? Okay. So here's... Here's the link for that, that video we just watched in case you're interested in going back and seeing it all in one go. Cause I, you know, again, I had to stop like every sentence cause there was just lies or, or massaging of the data or omission of, of facts or, or lacking context. And it takes a while to, to debunk all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is humiliating Natalie and that's not fair. Why would you do that to a child? Right. I mean, a kid. Who's absolutely 0% responsible for providing their own lunch. Right. Or providing funds for their lunch. Uh, yeah. Ridiculous. Yep. Just punishing people for being poor. All right. Um, who are we going to raid now? Yeah. Who are we going to raid? Oh, everyone on, on Twitch left already. So. Oh, well. Me. I'm just kidding. You're not online right now. I and am. You online. use my same. <laughs> you use my same feed, so I can't raid myself. I used to be on my own. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, but you you only wanted to do 20 minute streams, and people wanted more. They they weren't ready. Oh, they weren't ready. No. All right. Well, we'll we'll shout out someone on Twitch anyway. Who should we shout out? Shark three zero. Okay. So if you like good leftist content, if you are craving debates that aren't so debate broy, but but are you know more, more substantive and from someone who's actually debating with compassion, also a good person to check out. So, he's yeah. funny. Yeah, uh, he's yeah, funny and entertaining, but also smart and and right and, and most of the stuff that you know. Yeah. He's got good takes most of the time. Um, so yeah, check out Shark Thirty Zero. We'll shout out someone also in Left Signal Boost TV, the the Facebook leftist content creator network that I am a a member of. Um, let's see who we're at. Who who did we shout out last time? I think we did Revolutionary Ra Revolution Radio. So this time we will shout out the mind of the skeptical leftist. Another member of the collective. So go check them out. Go check out Left Signal Boost TV. If you yourself are a content creator, if you know of someone who is, who does leftist stuff, doesn't matter what the medium is. We have artists, we have authors, we have podcasters, streamers, YouTube video creators. Any 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 sort of thing is, is welcome. Um, yeah, you can just, you can go there and sign up on the on the pin post and become a member yourself. And we can work together to push back against the the algorithm on Facebook that favors right wingers like Ben Shabibo and the like. And speaking of being creative, just in case he forgot to tell you, Bread Theory has some real sick merch coming out soon. Yep, I did mention that going into the stream, but I can I can link it one more time. There's some lady tank tops and some man's tank tops. We shouldn't gender clothing, but you know, like there's certain cuts, right? Right. 
So we'll just yeah. I mean, you you can decide for yourself which yeah. which sort of stuff is good for you. What what suits your body? How are you feeling hmm? today? For sure. In a plethora of colors that were pre-approved by me. Yes, yes, we went through quite a quite a process of approving colors. I'm very helpful. He's very helpful, no no doubt. <coughs> if you all were here right now, you could have some cookies. I made some chocolate chip pecan cookies. They're very delicious. I can I can attest to that. But anyway, uh, we'll wrap it up for the night. And tomorrow night, we're going to be continuing on. We're going to finish up the last little bit of chapter one in a people's history of the united states um and then we're going to move into chapter two of that book uh trish will be joining me again perhaps amanda we'll see how she's doing after work but uh so so natalie says they used to announce over the speaker at lunch for any child who has a two-day negative lunch money balance uh way back when i was a grade so list the children that had a negative money balance oh that's so cruel uh give you a butter and bread sandwich and had to sit at a different table that's that's so incredibly cruel what did the kids do to deserve that sort of treatment all that singling out how does that help them oh and then the kids see it and then they find out why and then they're like ah, you're poor ah, well yeah i'm poor. sure they seem right away that they're poor and kids love to tease any sort of difference or mm -hmm. oh, that's so bad <laughs> i'm really sorry that that's terrible what happened at your school jeez all right well we're gonna wrap it up for tonight Join us again tomorrow night, about 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. Same bread channel, same bread host. <laughs> same loaf, different slice. Wow, that's much better. I'm going to use that as my tagline from now on. Yeah, I, like, I like all your poses you're doing, too. Yeah, that's really sad now, man. That's that's really cool. Anyway, see you all tomorrow night. Have a good night. Take uh, care. Enjoy the last few hours of your weekend. And don't forget to get left behind. Did I? Yeah. yeah. Never mind. That didn't work. Okay. Same loaf, different slice. Peace out.